okay it's being recorded so welcome to the second lecture of business technology innovation so um first of all an announcement that the um enrollment for the groups is open i uh, promised that it would be open at 8 30 and it was so uh, you can now enroll for a group and remember that the number uh, your group number determines the time and day of your um, uh, of your work group sessions on uh, the end of September, beginning of October, and somewhere in November. Um, yeah, the group sessions are online, so they're, they are not offline. Uh, they, they can't be. The uh, groups are a bit too big, and there are not enough rooms left at the university. So, unfortunately, everything is online uh, for this course. Um, although we're managing quite well, I'd say, uh, online. Would it be possible to create more groups? Uh, if they're full, I'll, I'll do. If they're not full, nope. Um, because we have uh, five work group session, uh, yeah, five sessions, um, and in each sessions we can fit six groups. If they're full, <laughs> seriously? Oh my god. Okay. Um, let me think after the lecture what I'll do. Um, because um, either we have to uh, uh, have another work group session somewhere, um, or um, I, uh, well, let me check. Uh, I think six people in a group is a bit too much. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll create more groups. Probably will be that on Friday in the morning or Friday afternoon. Um, but I'm not going to do that now. I'm going to do it after lecture. Um, so uh, yeah, last week we uh, dis uh, spent a lot of time uh, discussing the the groups, and I had a and we did a kind of a case uh, to see how innovation in IT affects organizations, um, and we spent some time uh, discussing what an innovation is. So today we'll pick up uh, that discussion again, and I'll talk about innovation typologies, innovation management, and a bit about open innovation. Um, so first of all, I want to um, well repeat some of the previous lecture um, because we kind of went a bit quick uh, with defining innovation. So I also updated the slide a bit to make it a bit more easy uh, to read. So an innovation uh, like we discussed yesterday, uh, yesterday, yeah, last week is an invention plus something more. So an innovation, an invention is that you create something for the first time that you actually add, invent a new technology, a new process, whatever in your organization. We will discuss the whatever in a bit. And an innovation is that invention plus value. Uh, so plus market entry, plus value creation by changing behaviors, interaction processes, etc. So value creation by changing behaviors, interaction process, et cetera, means that um, you can invent anything you like, but it's only useful if actually people want to use it because they have a new need, a new want, they can use it for something, you know, because they can change their behavior interaction processes with it. Um, so an innovation thinks about what can people do with it? Why is it useful? And it thinks about how um, can people start using it. So how can we use it in the market? Finally, innovation is iterative in nature, and that's that means that innovations usually build upon each other. So it's hardly ever that there's something completely disruptive, um, although sometimes there is. So, for example, I don't know if you remember this. Um, this is Google Glass. Um, so, would you call this an innovation or an invention? Invention, invention, innovation, innovation. Let's do a poll. <laughs> Okay, enter a title for this poll, uh, glass, question mark, type it up, oh, okay, uh, uh, innovation, invention. 
save. Launch. Okay, so we get kind of a uh, two-thirds innovation, one-third invention. Um, so more people think it's innovation than invention. And I already saw a few remarks in the chat. So innovation because they were in the market, uh, invention because it didn't sell. Um, yeah, but they did try to sell. Is selling a must-have part of an innovation? Question mark. Um, more about that in a minute. Can someone, I'm pulling back to this. So, but the technology was installed elsewhere, military, etc. Uh, yeah. Yep. The reason I use Google Glass because it has uh, characteristics of both. Um, so Google um, launched it as an innovation, um, but actually, at least for the consumer market, it was more an invention than an innovation. So there was not really a very clear business case for the consumer market. Um, you could do some things with it, um, but I didn't really think about the exact behaviors and needs of the uh, consumer. Um, and they also did not really consider I think that's also very important for innovation. You don't really consider the wider societal consequences. So there was a lot of backlash from Google Glass um, because it would lead to you know people recording each other uh, without them knowing and without their consent. Um, and indeed, what you now see is that uh, within more specific markets like the military, um, healthcare, um, you see that these glasses get some traction. Um, now, I think the, the Google Glasses were separate from the virtual reality uh, uh, glasses. So it, I think it's more like a concurrent um, uh, innovation or invention. Um, and of course, it, this was augmented reality instead of virtual reality. So, you know, you see your surroundings but with a layer on top of it instead of a completely virtual environment. Um, but you see that now, um, it's getting some traction. So they were a bit, maybe um, they were a bit, you know, uh, ahead of the market. But that backlash has had its added value to society as well, right? Maybe more in a policy wise addition than a let's sell this stuff kind of value. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But not, yeah, so this was from the point of view of Google. So uh, we have an invention, we want to turn it to innovation, we want to sell it. Um, but it has um, at its added value to society as well. And so for one in a policy-wise addition, yeah, so people thinking about the implications of a technology like this, um, but also it has started people to think of, the, of the, the use of an innovation like this. So um, first of all, what are the uh, uh, consequences for privacy, et cetera, uh, but how can we use it? And we'll see, yeah, well, for, 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 for now we are. So um, 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 I, So if you look at an innovation, so, and, and how an innovation spreads to society, um, that's wider than a company's perspective. Uh, and next week we'll talk about, is that next week? Yeah, next week we'll talk about diffusion of innovation. And then we'll talk about how an innovation spreads throughout uh, uh, society as a whole. Um, and uh, we'll discuss when innovations become a success and when they stop. But for now, uh, yeah, sorry about uh, uh, me not mentioning it. Um, we're thinking about it from the company's perspective, yeah. So it's kind of in, so Google Glass is kind of in between. Um, so um, 
when you think of an invention, you know, turn it in, in, into an innovation, you have to think about the user, the market, etc. So um, in two weeks, we're going to talk about an innovation and the user. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about um, the diffusion of an innovation throughout uh, the market, throughout society, from a more um, societal perspective. Today, we're going to talk about uh, innovation types and also a bit about organizational consequences of innovation. So, of course, another example of uh, innovation is uh, what Apple does. So, if you look at Google Glass, that's something that's pretty new. You know, it wasn't there before. You know, maybe had some um, more scientific applications or military applications or uses for it. But this was the really first time that we were confronted, we as consumers were confronted with a augmented reality glass um, and uh, invention. Um, if you look at Apple, um, they were really innovative, like very, uh, so they disrupted the market when they first introduced the iPhone. Um, but if you look at Apple now, they're still innovative, but the innovations they do are more incremental. So it's, uh, it's more, it's an update to their phone. It's, uh, they're now working on um, integrating um, the, their different operating systems, you know, mobile and um, uh, laptop and desktop uh, into, into each other. Um, so they're still innovating, but it's more incremental than a more completely new technology. So both of those things can be an innovation. So I think we ended here with defining innovation. Um, and you see from both of these uh, definitions that an innovation is not something completely new without considering anything else but it's something new while considering implementation of the innovation okay so the next thing is taking you through the innovation process and i think you all have seen figures like this in which you see kind of a process of innovation that that you identify problems, you uh, investigate uh, issues that people have, you uh, uh, generate ideas, uh, you evaluate these ideas, you implement it. So these are all kinds of um, innovation processes uh, or um, the process of creativity. So all kinds of different yet similar names. And they all tell something about the innovation process. So this is just an example. So you have, if, if you Google innovation process, you get like thousands of these uh, fancy pictures. But it's to show you that innovation consists of different stages. Um, so, of course, first of all, there's always kind of an exploration phase uh, with innovation. So which basically is the innovation process within the organization. So the exploration phase is um, thinking about as an organization or getting ideas or uh, some disruption in the market that causes an organization to think about, okay, we want to do something new. Um, and that's called exploration. So within the organization, you think, okay, what new, can we, new stuff can we do? thinking about solutions to issues, uh, working on prototypes, etc. Next comes exploitation. You have to think about, okay, how are we going to bring this to market? Again, this is from the perspective of the organization. Um, that's called the business model. So if you have an invention or an innovation in an organization, next thing you have to think about, okay, it only becomes an innovation if we um, can make money with it and if, or make money or if people start using it. And that's thinking about the business model. We do that in two weeks. When you thought about the business model as an organization, um, you implement the innovation and you hope that the innovation spreads throughout the market. And the market is not like everyone in society, uh, but it's your market. You know, if you make products for a selected group, diffusion means that everyone in that group or most of them um, get the innovation. And that's um, 
spread of innovation and diffusion. We talk about that next week. So this week, most of the time, we talk about innovation process in organization and innovation topics. So, um, I said something about it on the last slide, but if you think about it, what triggers innovations um, in organizations or what triggers organizations to start innovating to come up with inventions, um, it can be numerous things. So I think in the book by, um, in the book chapter by, I think this was from the body um, book chapter, they mentioned, or from Smith, I forgot, uh, they mentioned three trigger events. So they say, for, well, first of all, of course, innovation can start because people have a good idea in their organization, idea generation, creativity. That's one that seems obvious, logical. Um, but the second one is that something happens in society. Um, I here I made a typo, sorry. But it's scientific discovery, you know, it's something that, that has been invented somewhere else um, or some other thing that happens, um, which forces you as an organization to take action and to start to change. Now, closely related to, to scientific discovery is technological breakthrough, oftentimes that is accompanied by uh, scientific discoveries. And that there's some new technology, think about um, Augmented reality, for example, if it takes off, think about the um, uh, music industry uh, a decade ago. Um, we saw some technological breakthroughs that forced companies to change and to innovate. Finally, not mentioned in the chapter, but it's that also market, the markets and competitors can force you to start innovating uh, because they have come up with something new because people's needs change. <coughs> uh, technological breakthrough examples, uh, yes. Um, for example, the invention of the compact disc uh, by Philips, uh, um, and then later on the uh, in invention of, um, um, well, not the invention, but the rise of uh, broadband internet, um, because that one uh, completely changed the music industry and the uh, um, and also the video uh, industry. So that's a technological, for example, so especially the latter one. So the uh, availability of uh, high-speed broadband internet is, is something that completely disrupted the market without people first realizing that it would be so. So that's a technological breakthrough that has like a ripple throughout um, society as a whole and changed a lot of markets and a lot of organizations. So those are two examples, but I'll, Yeah, uh, absolutely. Government and regulations could also be a trigger event. And I was just thinking about it um, when I reread these trigger events and I thought, well, the whole society part is missing. Um, uh, because this is from one article and there is an other one that that gives a, uh, um, a, more, um, a more extensive list. Um, and I think I should have combined the two and added the whole societal part because sometimes changes in society, um, changes in governments and regulations also force uh, organizations to innovate. So, so a very simple example are the climate goals. Yeah, climate change, absolutely. Yeah, so climate change is a societal thing, but it's also that the government has instated regulations for organizations to you know reduce their energy use with such and such percent and that may also trigger innovation yeah so thanks well done i really should have added that yeah an economic crisis can also be an example can also trigger innovation um we'll see in a uh, couple of lectures when we talk about i think it it's in the lecture on organization strategy that, of course, an uh, economic crisis can also hamper innovation you know, because companies cut back on costs. Aren't those just an extension of the market? 
yeah so uh, uh, yeah so i think economic crisis can you can fit that into market competitors um yeah war is a major driver for innovation i think that's also a, let let's just you know let me just add society <laughs> here and then let's just dock everything like war and climate change under society one moment Solved. <laughs> so absolutely, yeah, I should have uh, uh, done societal uh, events. Uh, should have included societal events here. Um, the interesting thing. So on the right side, you see ID triggers. Um, and that's related to the first one, the trigger event. So that's related to ID generation creativity. So that's everything that happens within organizations. So uh, uh, the other things, scientific discovery technology breakthrough is mostly outside of organizations, so not necessarily. Um, but IT generation creativity is what happens within organizations. And how does that happen? Well, first of all, sometimes you can have what's called the Lone Ranger. Um, that's someone in an organization or someone outside an organization who brings an ID to an organization. Um, a bit more about that on the next slide. Um, the second thing is R&D. So you have in many larger organizations, you have a research and development department, which actually which, whose job it is to research and develop new, new stuff. So innovation is that thing. Uh, and finally, we talked about that at the end of the lecture is open innovation. So you increasingly see that organizations um, not only pay attention to their own organization innovation, but you know, increasingly include others like the general public or other experts into their innovation process. And when you think about innovation, so when you ask people what is innovation, they immediately think about you know the pictures on the right. You know they think of a, uh, a professor uh, or an inventor who in his garage invents new things, or someone as the top picture kind of shows who has suddenly a very creative idea. Um, and that's also what you see in movies. You know the lone scientist who comes up with the solution to counter aliens or whatever. Um, but this almost never happens in real life. Um, maybe a couple of hundred years ago, but now not. So innovations we associate with the creative individuals, you know, the prototypical genius inventor. Um, and creativity is like an amalgamation of abilities, knowledge, etc. But in an organization, creativity and innovation is more often a group process. It's also what I do in my in my work. You know, I'm not working alone uh, doing my research. You know, I work together with other people. I visit conferences. I read um, scientific papers, um, and together that allows me to do my research and innovate. Well, a bit. Um, so innovation is not what you think the prototypical inventor. Um, also, pretty interesting, by the way, if you. Uh, uh, Google scientist um, or inventor, um, the pictures you end up with is uh, a white older male wearing a white jacket, um, which says something about the stereotypes we have about inventors and scientists. Um, well, I happen to be an older white male, but in general, that's not true of scientists or inventors. Um, that they're all like that. Um, but that's something different. So um, innovation is more often a group process. You know, innovation happens most of the time within research and development departments um, across uh, departments or even outside the organization with open innovation. So innovation is a combination of organizational um, affordances. We call those things affordances, but you can see them as characteristics. Um, 
So for an organization to be innovative, we need people who want to be innovative. We need knowledge management in order to make sure that people can share information with each other. Um, the organization strategy, culture and structure needs to support the innovation, etc. But more about that later. So in short, the characteristics of an organization affect the organization's innovation capabilities. I have a bit more about that later, uh, a heading called innovation management. But for now, a bit more about the um, process of innovation. So um, what you see, and this is, this is the with the exploration phase, but also the innovation uh, as a whole, you see that organizations have ideas or they come up with ideas because some trigger in the market or because they bought some technology or experienced some uh, competitor um, using a new technology. So that results in objects, which don't necessarily have to be physical objects, which result if you diffuse the innovation, it becomes a success, people using it in practice. Um, and the reason I want to show this slide is because if you look at the number of ideas going in and the number of practices resulting um, from the invention or from the innovation, it's usually like a thousand, hundred, ten, one rule. So you have a thousand ideas, a hundred of which are kind of feasible. Um, you will, will have ten different concepts uh, like those objects in the middle. And maybe you have one uh, that may be a success. Um, and maybe it's even less. So the process of innovation is always gathering more, many ideas and then thinking about which ones are good and which ones are less good. And when you think about what is good and what is not good, that has to do with the innovation part. If do people actually want it? Can they use it? Does it fill a need, um, etc. Um, so this is the prototypical idea you see. So the process from ideation to practice, that's is what we call the innovation funnel. Um, so it's from many, many ideas to ultimately very few innovations in practice. And if you look at this picture in detail, you see that basically the invention part is are, the, are mostly the ideas. And then when you think about what you can do with all those ideas, so um, you make prototypes and you test these, you try to commercialize these ideas, and finally you, you result in something new. Um, that's the whole innovation part. Okay. So the next thing on the list is innovation types. Um, so when we think of an innovation, um, we have kind of an intuitive idea that an innovation is a product. You know, it's something like Google Glass, it's a new phone, it's, it's, it's a new thing, um, a physical thing. But you have many different innovation types. So this is a, um, uh, a picture which kind of shows innovation, um, shows the extent of how you can innovate as an organization. Um, so on the next slide, I have a um, a more uh, uh, well a more concise way of uh, uh, explaining the types of innovation. But let's first give me give you this example of how you can innovate as an organization. So there are a lot of different ways to, uh, uh, to innovate. So first of all, if you look at the financial part of your organization, you, know, you can innovate your business model. So you can innovate how you make money. Um, so, um, so if you think about the music industry, um, before, um, we had streaming music. Um, artists actually made money by selling their music, you know, by selling CDs. Um, but now, hardly any artist can 
live from the sales of their music. So they, so you have to be streamed like millions and millions of times on Spotify to make even a small amount of money. So how most artists make money, make money nowadays is by giving away their music practically for free um, and then earning money by um, you know, giving concerts. So giving concerts has become much, much, much more important in the revenue streams of artists than before um, the change in the business, uh, education, and music industry. So that's given in by technological innovations, but it's a change, it's an innovation in business model of um, an artist. So you can also innovate with networking. So for example, like Google or Apple uh, in their uh, app stores um, partner with a lot of uh, application developers, uh, which is a kind of a new way of making money. You know, every uh, um, app that is sold, they have to give 30% of the sales to uh, the app store. So that's one uh, type of innovation. So you can innovate a process. So there are a couple of examples of this slide. So I just nicked the slide from uh, something else. I don't know I, all these examples. Um, but you can innovate your process. So for example, uh, Dell, um, but also, um, uh, and I think it's a bit of an older example, but maybe a better example is the Japanese automobile industry, um, because they were the first to make their uh, to change their whole production process into a thing they called uh, just-in-time production. Um, that's guy, I think it's called Kazai or so in, uh, in Japanese, um, in, which allows them to be way more flexible and way more quicker in making cars. So it was way more cheaper because it, because it was just-in-time uh, uh, production and just-in-time logistics. They didn't really have to have a huge inventory and huge stock. So they planned everything in such a way that they, they could uh, produce everything that every order that came in um, and could be very flexible. So they were the first one to adopt kind of a production process like that. And then basically the whole automobile industry followed. Um, of course, that's what we talked about before. You can also innovate in terms of what they call here offering. And that's new products. Um, new services, etc. And finally, you can innovate in terms of delivery. You know, you can try to innovate because you want to be the best brand. You can innovate in terms of customer experience. Um, and you can innovate in terms of channels uh, that you can um, buy the products uh, through. Um, so you can innovate in a lot of different ways, but I think this is a bit too extensive. Is LinkedIn an example of networking or social media? Um, uh, you tell me. So I, I think, yeah, I think LinkedIn is social media, um, but I also think that networking is an integral part of social media. So there's no social media without networking. Um, so, why the question, by the way? And we have a lecture on social media uh, in organizations. And basically the whole lecture, I'll talk about what social media is and the different characteristics of social media. That's a pretty fun lecture because we uh, we discuss about what exactly social media is and we talk about the definition of social media. So, but I'll, I'll um, let's keep that for a later lecture because else I uh, become uh, uh, a bit distracted. Um, so let's continue with innovation for now. Um, so if you look at the uh, uh, different types of innovation, I think this is a bit more of a useful. Um, uh, way of distin uh, distinguishing between different types of innovations. Um, so first of all, you have a product or service innovation. 
So a product is a new thing, a physical thing. Um, a service is a, you know, yeah, a service, you know, uh, uh, a way to distribute music, uh, a way to uh, uh, sell you uh, financial products, you know, financial products on its own are service, services. Um, what I do for you is a service. I work in the service industry as well. Um, so you can innovate not only in physical products, but also with services. So that's one. The second type of innovation is process innovation. You can innovate your internal or external processes and organization. Think of um, those uh, platforms where you can book hotels or Airbnbs or Airbnb. So that's an example. It's a service innovation, but also a process innovation because they completely changed um, the process of booking hotels and the whole um, and everything accompanying it, all financial structure, etc. Um, I have some examples later. So the third one is business model innovation. And that's um, thinking about different ways to make money. Also Airbnb, um, you completely change the whole value proposition of an industry. So they completely changed the way that, so booking has completely changed the way that we book hotels, um, which is also a change in business model. Some examples later. And finally, you have a paradigm innovation. And a paradigm innovation means that you, as an organization, completely redo your organization strategy. So it basically means that you, as an organization, think, okay, we have been doing this, but we're now are going to focus on something different. Um, this usually doesn't happen overnight. So when you look at uh, Philips, for example, they um, started with, out with making light bulbs um, and Philips now is mostly, or maybe even only a medical company. So they make medical instruments. Um, so it has kind of been a paradigm shift in the way they do business. Am I, can you still hear me? So I was talking about Philips and that Philips were, used to make light bulbs and now it's only or made mostly in the medical, uh, in the medical business, in the medical industry. So they have like shifted um, their organization strategy. Everyone with me? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's usually so as is Amazon, a business model innovation or a paradigm innovation. Usually when you see those big changes in the markets over a couple of years, like Amazon, Airbnb, the music industry, um, it's a combination of basically everything. You know, it's a process innovation. Uh, it's a business model innovation. It's a paradigm innovation. So for example, Amazon makes a lot of money maybe even more than with selling books um, because they uh, because they give away or give away because they rent out computer room um, so if you need something uh, to be processed if you need um, temporary space amazon has that and those amazon services that those are an example of them repositioning themselves so uh, Amazon started out with, you know, amazon.com in order to do that, they needed a lot of, um, uh, hardware and they, so for, to, to, uh, keep track with busy times. Uh, so when people ordered a lot of stuff at the same time, um, then it turned out that they had a lot of, um, processing software and hardware capacity left, um, most of the time. And then they thought, huh. Oh, what can we, what else can we do with all that processing capacity? Oh, well, we can rent out that processing capacity to other organizations who need it. Um, and then later on, oh, we can also start a streaming service. Um, so basically if you, Amazon started out by selling books, what Amazon is now is mostly a 
platform service. So they offer lots of services for which you need um, cloud services, as you know, um, so cloud hardware, software processing time. Um, and based on that ID that they are a cloud service, that that has spurred a lot of different innovation. So that of so them being a cloud service of also of course allowed them to implement a streaming service of etc. So it's basically a combination of many things. So it's it's a paradigm innovation. Um, um, that they completely change the strategy. It's an, a change of business model. They're making money with uh, different new types of services, but they also, with their being one of the first to sell products online, it's a process innovation um, and it's a service innovation. So it's basically everything. And you see that more often. So, um, I think that I talked about the difference between products or service um, um, to already too long. So if you think about a service innovation, so of course this also relates to business models and new ideas of business models, but a supermarket delivery is um, an example of a service innovation. It provides me a new service. Um, like I have my um, products delivered at home. So Picnic and Crisp are two examples of online delivery. And as a question before we go on a short break, so how, how would this be different from uh, a store? So, um, so if, if you look at, um, so it, well, if you look at the physical things that Picnic needs, um, so they don't need stores, but what, what does Picnic need instead of a store? Yeah, they need warehouses. Um, so they have warehouses with a lot of stuff in them, but what else do they need instead of warehouses? So um, if you look at, so uh, yeah, vans, apps, cars, uh, a way to deliver the products, staff drivers. Do you have any idea how the product get to the warehouse? Yeah, so suppliers. So, um, so this is again an example of it's relatively easy to come up with an ID, huh, online supermarket, easy, but it's pretty difficult to think about, okay, what do you need? So you need a platform. Um, so people can order the uh, uh, products. You need a distribution session, you need a warehouse. You need to have contracts with suppliers, uh, transporters, distribution centers to deliver the products to you. Um, you need, a logistic system so that you know how much you order from those um, suppliers. You need uh, a way to deliver the products. Are you going to do that yourself? Or are you going to outsource it? Um, you need, yeah, you need the app, you need the customer, you need the, uh, uh, the platform. Um, so you need a lot of different things. So it's an innovation, but it in involves a lot of organizational change. Um, oh, oops. And yeah, you need a good marketing plan, absolutely. Um, yeah, Picnic had a very good marketing plan and it's, it's called Corona <laughs> because uh, I think they said uh, a couple of hundred percent more turnover, I think now, but, 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 but still uh, even before Corona, Picnic was already a success. Yeah, you need drivers as well. So when I um, last week ordered from uh, Crisp, which is another online supermarket, and they, um, there's also an example of a service innovation, but they also uh, innovate their, um, uh, their process because they don't rely on distribution centers. So if you um, look into how this works, there are actually only, I think, three players in the Netherlands who, 
um, do the distribution. So who deliver goods to the supermarkets, to the supermarket warehouses. So everyone who makes something in the Netherlands, you know, all farmers, etc., they can only choose from three major distributors that they can deliver their products. And Crisp said, no, we want to change that process as well. So we innovate um, our uh, process. So they um, have contracts with a lot of smaller suppliers that deliver products to them, to their warehouse directly. Um, and Crisp is, you know, it's a biological thing. So it's, uh, it's pretty expensive. So that's how they can turn a profit like that. So for them, the innovation is not only in delivery, but also a bit in the process behind it. So they skipped the warehouse, um, uh, the warehouses, the little farms. I, I don't know that. So explain. So it will take you a while. So I'll first do the, uh, uh, the tiny farms, but do, do they deliver directly to, uh, to the little? Oh, seriously. Yeah, well, like that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and I think sorry. Um so I think you see that more now more uh, you see that more and more nowadays. So some sometimes when you you, you know you drive past the farm you say you, you, there's a sign there and it says this farm delivers directly to Jumbo or Albert Heijn or something like that. So I, I think an innovation may be that, that, that the supermarkets are trying to, um, to cut out um, the distribution centers because they have a lot of power in the supermarket business. Um, but thanks for the example. Okay, we're drifting off a bit. Um, I want to uh, finish uh, two slides and then I suggest we have a, a short break. Uh, sorry, three slides. So an example of process innovation is Dell. Um, and Dell may not seem a very innovative brand nowadays, but they were the first one who did the direct sales to consumers. So they were the first one where you can order a computer online, you can choose your type of computer, you know, your processor, your, your hard disk, etc., And they would build it once you ordered it and send it to your home directly. Um, so they have been doing that for like 20, 25 years or so. Um, and they were the first one, um, first ones to do that. So before you could just buy off the shelf computers uh, from a store or maybe from IBM directly, but you were not able to customize that. Um, so Dell was the first one to change the whole process of ordering um, uh, computer hardware. So Netflix, I think, is an example. It's also a new business model, but it's also an example of how the service and process combines. Um, so it's an innovation that's not, you know, renting a movie is not new. Um, so it's not that it's a completely new product, um, but it's a new way of delivering it. So they change the process and they provide a service instead of a product. So it's a combination of both. Service product business model is Netflix as well, um, but also if you look at Apple, you know if you look at uh, um, if you look at iTunes specifically, uh, how they start start that. It's a new service, so delivering music um, uh, from one online store. So they're one of the first to do that. It's a new process. You, you don't longer have to buy CDs or download it via Napster, but you can have, you have one place where you can buy music. Um, and it's a new business model because they Apple can make money by um, selling that music instead of only providing the hardware uh, and software used to play that music. And we talked about that before, things like Uber and Airbnb are examples of basically innovation in everything. So things like Uber have really changed the whole um, taxi business. So it's, it has forced other taxi companies to um, 
think about changing your strategy as well. It's your new business model because Uber and also Airbnb, they don't actually own anything. They're just a platform and they work with, you know, yeah, flex workers who do um, the driving or the delivering for them. They deliver a new process and it's a new service. Yeah, so service and process innovation often overlap um, because I, you know, a service is, is an intangible thing. So a service usually also forces you to think about the way you get that service delivered and, and the way you get a service delivered to you like music, that, that's, a, yeah, that's a process. Um, so they oftentimes overlap, but um, you sometimes also see that organizations you know, within an organization think about um, um, how they can innovate their own internal process. And that's really an, an, an example of only a process innovation. Okay, so we've been using these and these processes or these and these machines to make a certain product. Now we're going to do that differently. We're going to outsource something. We're going to make something else. Uh, and that's an example of, a, of how you as an organization internally change your process, um, but to the exterior, to the consumer, um, continue to do the same thing. So you only innovate your internal organization and that's purely a process organization. So what Dell um, has done is also a bit of a providing a service but it's mostly thinking of, it's mostly a process innovation because it does not only allow direct sales to consumers, but it also allows more customization and flexibility options within your organization itself. Okay. The next thing I want to do is talk about innovation typologies, um, but I, Suggest that we have a short break here, ten o'clock or so, and then we uh, uh, and then we continue with innovation typologies. Okay, see you in a bit.
Okay, let's continue. Um, oh, one moment. I had to close the door. I, uh, I have a question which is not at all related to the course. So uh, during the break, I was talking with my uh, my girlfriend who's also working from home and she wondered how many of you actually um, were still in bed when this lecture started and was doing and was following the lecture from his or her bed. Do not say yes or no in the chat. I'm going to do a poll because now I'm very curious. Uh, No, 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 I want to do a different poll, uh, edit. Ah, oh, man, come on, seriously? Okay, hit me. Ah, 7 a.m. Uh, Liberian time. Oh. Ah, yeah, of course. Um, I tend to think that Liberia is like right to the south of us, but of course it's a lot to the, uh, uh, to the west as well. Ah, yeah. Okay, 30 to 70%. 30% uh, yes. That's more than I, uh, more than I expected. Yeah, for example, online lecture. Yeah, that's what I uh, talked about. And we also, um, so in our um, uh, WhatsApp group chat, we have uh, with our uh, uh, with our uh, communication colleagues, um, there was also a discussion how many of them would still be in bed. So I thought, why not just ask? Well, I'm not. No, George is in Liberia. Ah, now sir, Ah. That's the cool thing about online teaching as well. It has become very internet. So people attending from all around the globe. Uh, uh, there is, by the way, there are other students from uh, uh, from Liberia at our uh, uh, department, Dogar. Uh, uh, um, I don't remember her first name. Um, yeah, I'm also wondering if people would wake up in the middle of the night to follow a lecture, especially since it's also recorded. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm still very thankful that you're here in uh, well, in real life, at least synchronously, um, it's for me. It's a lot more fun than only talking to us and only talking to a screen. Now, I at least have the impression that uh, uh, that some people are paying attention. So, thanks for 124 of you for following this lecture. Um, so, okay, innovation typologies. 
It's again, sorry. I think uh, if you're a bachelor student, you have will have taken communication theory uh, from me last year, and then you'll probably remember that I get distracted easily a lot. Um, so uh, sorry about that beforehand. Um, but now, focus on the lecture. Get back to uh, innovation tech, innovation typologies. Um, so we talked about the innovation process. We talked about different types of innovation. Now we'll talk about also about um, innovation uh, types of innovation in terms of innovation typologies. Um, so I already said, if you look at the different types of innovations, um, um, there is like broadly a distinction in two, disruptive and incremental. And they call disruptive, sometimes radical, um, many different names, but it's usually the distinction is between something that is an innovation because it kind of adds something smaller to an existing innovation, or the innovation is disruptive in that it's a completely new innovation. Um, that's also important for the business plan you'll have to work on. And that's that um, you, you don't necessarily have to come up with something completely new. And an innovation is often building upon other innovations. So if you come up with something that already exists, but build upon it, that's also a good idea for an innovation and for a business plan. But of course, whatever you want. Um, So a disruptive or radical innovation is something that is new. So and new means that it's it's a it's it's it may be a new invention, so a new technology, but it is also then always a start of a new um, adoption life cycle. It's the start of a new life cycle in a for a different product or service, and that means it needs to be diffused in the market again. Um, so in a disruptive innovation, suddenly everyone has need to switch how they do, how they were used to doing things. And um, yeah, people need to adopt a new technology or a new service and learn to work with it. Um, so for example, the shift from compact discs to online music platforms is a disruptive innovation because it starts in your life cycle. You suddenly have to, uh, have to transfer or uh, buy your music online. Um, you suddenly have to adopt um, a smartphone a, or a, a, um, another way of playing your music uh, on your computer uh, or uh, in your home. Um, and so it needs, it needs to diffuse through the market again. Um, it can also be something completely new that it doesn't re that it doesn't replace something else. So you can also think of an innovation and completely come up with an example. So maybe you have one, but you can come up with an innovation that wasn't there before. So that you have a so that you um, try to um, you, you 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 try to convince people to have a new need that they didn't have before. Yeah, Zoom during COVID times is, is so of course we've always had a need for lectures. Well, uh, a need for teaching. Um, but something that, yeah, the first iPod may be an example, but it also builds on the need for, for us to listen to music. But sometimes you try to do different things. Yeah, face recognition to block the phone um, is indeed something different. Car is also different, but it may be made built upon uh, the need for transportation. Um, but but those are things that that not only you know face recognition, a car. Um, yeah, Facebook is I think is a good example that are. That, 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 are, that do not only force you to do something you've always wanted to do in a new way, um, but also create a new need. So um, 
And, and of course, it's never completely new. So we've always had the need for transportation. Uh, we've always had the need to uh, um, have a list of people um, as connections to present ourselves in certain ways. Um, but Facebook kind of, kind of yeah, built upon those needs and made them uh, made us more aware, made them more important. Uh, the same as the car. Uh, yeah, we're still talking about disruptive. Um, the same as the car built upon a need for transportation, but also has created a whole new thing for us to want, you know, a personal means of transportation. Um, so disruptive innovation can be something that is a need we have as people that is um, filled in in a completely new way, or it can even be something that we have never even thought about that we wanted in the first place. So that's disruptive. Incremental is building upon an existing innovation. Uh, yeah, so a disruptive innovation is something that is um, new. So it's either um, an, a completely new way of doing something um, we have up to now done in a different way, or it is playing into something that we didn't even know beforehand. So it's playing into a new need. Um, George, you're unmuted, so I'm going to mute you in uh, case you uh, accidentally say something. Uh, just to make clear, what's the difference of that disruptive radical innovation and invention? You know, well, an invention is, it's, it's only a disruptive radical innovation if it's adopted. Um, so, I can come up with an invention, uh, you know, uh, a new trash can which uh, randomly uh, walks around the house on tiny feet, but it will not be an innovation um, because no one's going to buy it and no one cares. So an invention is something new, but only if it's something completely new and it's adopted, then it's an innovation. Yeah, so picnic is quite disruptive. Yeah, absolutely. And an adoption of an invention to the market uh, in the market is an innovation. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Um, so an incremental innovation is, is something that is, may not seem as innovative, but is an innovative. So think about the, uh, um, um, uh, a television with a, uh, a new type of sound system in it, so to deliver better sound. Think of um, OLED displays for televisions and computer screens instead of LED displays. Um, it's also a new technology, but it's not a radical innovation. It's not a new way of watching TV, television. Yeah, uh, think of a new iPhone. It has a better camera, a better screen. It has fancy updates to buttons, yeah, filters for Snapchat, absolutely. So these are all minor innovations. Well, they don't necessarily have to be very technical. You know, they can also be an update of a website. Um, they can uh, be like, um, you know, the, the one-click order that an Amazon has uh, patented, so that you can order a product in one click. That's you know, it's a technological thingy, but it's more of a service innovation than a, uh, an, a, uh, and a process innovation than a uh, technical innovation. So it doesn't necessarily have to be technical. Um, and if you look at those incremental innovations, Uh, let me get back to the question. So first, uh, let me finish my sentence. Um, so if you think of incremental innovations, they they don't really um, 
force the market into a new stage of diffusion and adoption. Um, so it's not that you have to convince people to, oh, you have to buy this, um, this new, completely new product. Of course, you have to convince people to buy the new iPhone, but you don't have to convince them to buy a smartphone. Um, and you usually see this in advanced stages of the product life cycle. So you see this in um, when most of the people have adopted the product and you see incremental changes in the technologies, in the technology. Um, and you all already see a dominant design. So if you indeed look at the uh, at Snapchat or iPhone, there is a dominant design. There is a way that people um, use the, the technology. Um, and innovations are only incremental. So it's not that suddenly the user interface is completely different. Um, so it's continual improvement and upgrades. Okay, back to the questions. Um, so an innovation has to sell well in order to be called an innovation. The intention of the creator is to increase sales. It's not enough. No, it's not enough. It's only innovation when it has value. Um, yeah, you could come up with an incremental innovation for your assignment. Although, admittedly, it's more fun if you come up with a disruptive innovation. Um, but both are possible. Um, to get back to the question, uh, to the question um, so in the examples I give, it's it's always I always say making money um, or increasing sales. Um, but the official definition is that an innovation has to create value. So if you are a not-for-profit or a governmental organization, um, and people adopt your innovation without you making money, so you give it away for free, or it's a governmental service or whatever, um, then it also has value because people use it. Um, so, um, so creating sales, yes, in many commercial instances, but it's about adding value. And value is not only monetary. Um, so is vinyl and CD an example of incremental innovation? And it's kind of in the middle. Um, so then we'll see. Um, I think that's a good bridge to the uh, next uh, typology. Um, but on the one hand, the transition from compact, from vinyl to compact disc is kind of disruptive because people had to adopt a new product anew, a CD player instead of a record player. But on the other hand, it's incremental because it builds upon the exact same need. You know, you have a physical object that plays your music. But I can explain that on the next on the next slide. Um, what would Apple Pay be? Incremental. Good question. I I think it's I think it's ultimately meant to be disruptive. Um, so they so Apple Pay is introduced in a way that, that, yeah, it can be both disruptive and incremental. You know, you have, uh, it's not one-on-one, -on -one. it can be in between and it can disrupt the market later on. So Apple Pay now is incremental, you know, you use it, you know, um, instead of your bank card. Um, but the idea behind Apple Pay is, is I think finally, to skip the banks altogether, you know, so that you have credit on Apple and that you don't need banks and you no, don't need those third party apps as agent and uh, to, uh, for your sales. So I think ultimately Apple tries to um, do part of the job that banks now do. And therefore, at least within the financial market, it can ultimately be uh, disruptive, but it may still be a bit too early in the 
in the adoption stage to uh, to know what the outcome will be. So, um, so to get back to the question, can information be innovation be both disruptive and incremental? Um, the answer is yes, because in order to be a disruptive innovation, you don't need to be disruptive in all aspects of the innovation. So if you look at the invention itself, it can be incremental because it builds upon an existing technology, the new version of the iPhone, or it can be completely new. Um, but it can also be, but, but still then, your innovation is, so if, if iPhone, if Apple suddenly um, changes the iPhone in something completely different, let's say, uh, you know, a human brain interface or something, um, it's a very disruptive technology, but at first instance, the customers may still be the same. Um, so, and usually when it's something is very disruptive, it disrupts everything, you know, it disrupts the whole, the, everything here. Um, but you can think about innovations being more incremental and disruptive than all these um, aspects. So, um, for example, an innovation can also require an organization to completely redo the way they do business. So to completely redesign your organization. Um, it can require you to new forms of expertise. So which basically means you would have to hire a bunch of people and fire a bunch of other people. Um, if you look at the market, when you can, it can be disruptive because you suddenly get new customers. Um, Apple used to be a brand which was very niche. It was only for people in the music industry and the design industry. But now Apple is for everyone um, with enough money. Um, So an innovation can build upon existing needs or can identify new needs. Yeah, yeah. Nothing is ever 100% original. Um, so you can build upon existing products. So even something like the iPhone, you know, Microsoft did that, I think five years before the iPhone with a uh, with a smartphone, with a touch screen. Um, and all the components of the iPhone, the phone part, the touchscreen part, the tablet part, um, already existed. So the whole this, the thing that Apple did was combining it with a easy to use interface. So it built on existing products, but it was disruptive because of the combination of existing um, innovations and inventions. So these are examples of how an innovation can be incremental or of what incremental and disruptive means specifically. Um, but it also shows that not everything has to be disruptive in a disruptive innovation. Okay, um, let me skip over this because I think it's best to discuss this one now. Um, so if you, look at, uh, so this is another typology of innovations. And you can see from the questions you have that maybe the, the simple distinction between incremental and disruptive is a bit too simple. And this is from the paper by uh, Aberna Abernathy, Abernathy, I don't know, and Clark. Um, and they give a two-dimensional definition of uh, uh, or they give a two-dimensional typology of innovations. And they say, for, well, um, an innovation can be, basically can be incremental and disruptive if you look at the technology, and it can be incremental and disruptive when you look at the market and the customers. Um, one moment. Um, so on the one hand, you can have, um, and, and those two dimensions re result in four new 
uh, four different types of, um, of innovations, uh, architectural, revolutionary, regular, and niche. Um, and that's the last thing I want to explain in this lecture. Uh, it's like using your phone, existing product to build an app, new product to render a service, right? Yeah, well, uh, for example, yeah, like that is, so it's, um, so you always use existing uh, technologies, but the whole, what, what Apple has built uh, and Google now, so the whole platform to build apps has been kind of disruptive. You know, it has, has, has uh, allowed a new economy to originate. Um, with people building apps and selling them on a platform like that. So that has been quite disruptive, but it builds upon things that already exist. Um, so a bike, oh, well, let, let's take the e-bike as an example. Um, so where would you fit an e-bike in this uh, uh, typology? Niche, regular, revolutionary, or architecture general. Niche. Yeah. Can someone say why it is niche and why it is architectural? can be a bit of everything. Now that I think of it, it's a difficult example. At least in the beginning, it was focused on the elderly market in the Netherlands. Oh, and they normally wouldn't buy the possibilities now for people who don't exercise. Yeah. I really did not think this example through. Um, so absolutely. So when uh, e-bikes started, they were um, at least focused on a new market. Um, and the technology, well, I think all the technology already existed, but I think the combination of the, um, somebody in, uh, say the innovations in, um, um, battery powered motors um, and combining that with a bike is a new structure. It's not completely new technology, but it's kind of a new uh, uh, structure. Um, so this actually is a bit of a combination of both because we now see that um, organizations have to, so they build e-bikes instead of regular bikes. So if, if, for, if you're a bike manufacturer, it disrupts the way you do business. So it disrupts your existing structure because you can build your bike, but suddenly you have to think about ah, where do we place the battery? How do we get the battery in the motor? So we need to outsource that. Um, so for bike manufacturers, it's been quite disruptive. Um, and then on the one hand, it focused on a new market. On the other hand, it focused on a uh, it now focuses on an existing market because more and more people have a regular bike now buy an e-bike. Yeah, so an electrical scooter was already there. Um, yeah, so like I said, an innovation is never new. Yeah, I would, so this actually would, would make a pretty interesting uh, exam question um, because um, depending on, um, on what stage in the adoption process you consider for e-bikes, uh, depending on the specific companies you have in mind, it, it can be different. Um, so if I think of an e-bike uh, um, now, I'd say for well, I'd say, well, as an organization, you need to adopt new technologies and structures. So of course we've already had batteries, but if you now are a bike manufacturer, you have to somehow arrange that that new technology is, is is in your bikes, so you have to outsource things. You have to new have a new uh, ways of production. Um, and I'd say that if you look at the market now, that that the market for e-bikes, so the market 
for e-bikes for elderly people, I think it's quite saturated. So at least in the Netherlands, um, they focus on the regular market, so on existing markets and customers. On the other hand, if you're not from the Netherlands, it's more disruptive. Um, for example, I saw an item on the news in Italy that they, they just cannot produce enough e-bikes uh, for the Italian market. Um, because everyone was used to go by car or public transportation or scooter. Um, but suddenly now they see, huh, well, um, the roads are quiet anyway, so why not go by e-bike? Um, so for them, um, for example, in Italy and basically everywhere, with the exception of the Netherlands and maybe Denmark, um, this would the adoption of e-bikes would be more disruptive. So I see we're already out of time. Um, so I, I still want to finish this and I have something to say about information, information management, uh, but if all goes right, then I don't need a full lecture next week because uh, diffusion of innovation is quite simple. So I suggest we um, leave it here and then next week I will summarize this, the um, matrix typology and do the rest of the lecture and then do diffusion of innovation. So you can get out of bed and get dressed. Oh, so general question about the literature. Um, I, the, the main focus of the exam is on the things I explain in the uh, lectures. Um, and I think that if you, um, so if there are specific things that I don't discuss in the lectures, which I think are important in the papers, I, um, I, I will specifically say that in the lecture. But in general, um, well, you see that this, the, um, of course, the presentations are based on the literature. So it's a good thing to read through the literature. But the exam will be based mostly um, on the lecture slides. Ah, oh, my God, there were seriously 69. Yeah, okay, but there's a lot of things that, uh, that, there, that I was not going to discuss anyway. So I, uh, but there are still a lot of things I have to do with it. Absolutely, sorry. Um, I have a quick question regarding group projects. Two people sign up for a group that we don't have contact info. I, yeah, I think you can send them a message through, uh, uh, through Canvas. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, to build them all so you can answer the questions and I'll do that. So I'll try to answer the questions about the um, um, about what I discussed now, not immediately, but after a while, and the general questions after the lecture. Um, so, okay, I'm going to quit now. Uh, I will check the groups and uh, if they're full or not and see if we can um, see if we have to um, uh, arrange for a sixth work group session, or maybe have another way of integrating them. So I'll, I'll let you know. But for now, thank you, and I'll see you next week. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>